The Apex 15R is a gaming laptop from Aftershock, a company who specialise in custom gaming PCs and laptops in Singapore, who recently opened up here in Australia. So let's find out how well their gaming laptop holds up. Let's start with the specs of my unit, as you can customise it a bit when ordering. I've got the 6-core Intel i7-8750H CPU here. It's got 16GB of memory running at DDR4 2666 in dual channel, but it can be upgraded to 32GB. For storage, it's got two M.2 slots, with support for NVMe storage. And I've got one 250GB SSD installed. There's a single 2.5-inch drive bay for hard drive or SSD, but that slot's empty in my unit. For the graphics, there's an NVIDIA GTX 1060 here in the Apex 15R. But you've also got the option of getting the GTX 1050 Ti in the Apex 15. This powers the 15.6 inch 1080p 144Hz AHVA panel, although the base model comes with a 60Hz IPS panel. For network connectivity, there's a gigabit Ethernet port, support for 802.11 AC Wi Fi, and Bluetooth. The Apex 15 has a black brushed metallic exterior, which is completely smooth, and this matches the interior. The sides are well rounded, but the front edge can feel a little sharp, but otherwise the build quality feels very solid. The dimensions of the laptop are 36cm in width, 24cm in depth, and just under 2cm in height, so a little smaller than many other 15 inch laptops due to the thin bezel which generally means a smaller footprint. The weight is listed as 1.95 kilos on the Aftershock website, and mine weighed very close to this. With the 180W power brick and cables for charging included, the total weight increases to 2.5 kilos. As mentioned, it's got a 15.6 inch 1080p 144Hz AHVA panel, although no G-Sync here. No problems at all with viewing angles. AHVA is like IPS in that viewing angles are excellent. I've measured the current colour gamut using the Spider 5 Pro, and my results returned 97% of sRGB, 67% of NTSC, and 72% of Adobe RGB, so not bad for a gaming laptop. At 100% brightness, I measured the panel at 371 nits in the centre, so fairly bright, and with a 730 to 1 contrast ratio. So again, pretty decent for a gaming laptop, and overall I thought it looked great. I've taken a long exposure photo in a dark room as a worst case backlight bleed test, and there was some bleed showing from the corners, although I never actually noticed this during normal use. However, this will vary between laptops. There was only minor screen flex while moving it. It was quite sturdy due to the metal exterior, and the hinges being out towards the far corners further aids in stability. It can't quite be opened up with one finger, there's slightly more weight towards the back, but no issue using it on my lap. Despite the thin screen bezel, the 720p camera is placed above the top of the screen. Both the camera and microphone are fairly average, but you'll be able to judge both for yourself. One of the standout features of the laptop is that it's got a mechanical keyboard with blue switches and a tactile 2mm depth, not something you'd expect from a 2cm thin laptop. The keys are RGB backlit too, with individual key customization and quite a few effects built in. The keys themselves were great to type with, but at times I did feel like they were a little close together for me. As a mechanical keyboard, the key presses can be quite loud. Here's how the keys sound to type with to try and give you an idea of what to expect. Aftershock also offer the laptop with brown switches instead, which offer silent linear feedback as opposed to the clicky tactile feedback with the default blue switches that I've got here. There was minimal keyboard flex while pushing down hard. Overall, the body was quite solid. Above the keyboard, towards the right, there's the power button and the fan boost button, which will increase the fan speed and improve cooling at the expense of fan noise. Fingerprints show up quite easily on the smooth metal lid and interior but as a smooth surface, they're easy enough to wipe off. The touchpad was smooth to the touch and worked well. It clicks down when you push, you can right click anywhere with two fingers, or otherwise one finger click down the bottom left or right hand sides for left or right clicks respectively. On the left, there's a Kensington lock, air exhaust vent, gigabit ethernet port, USB 2.0 Type-A port, and 3.5mm microphone and headphone jacks. On the right, there's two USB 3 Type-A ports, SD card slot, and air exhaust vent. On the back, there are two more air exhaust vents towards the corners. And then from left to right, we've got two mini DisplayPort outputs, HDMI 2.0 port, 
USB Type-C port, no mention of Thunderbolt support though, and the power input. The front has an RGB light bar in the center, which can be adjusted using the installed Control Center software, the same software you use to change the keyboard lighting. The speakers are found towards the front left and right corners. They sound decent for laptop speakers, clear at high volumes but not really any bass. On the back of the black brushed metal lid there's the Aftershock logo in the center with a mirrored finish. Underneath there's some pretty serious air vents right on the intake spots for the cooling fans and we'll see how the temperatures go soon. It was very easy to access the internals by simply taking out the screws with a Phillips head screwdriver. Inside we get easy access to the two M.2 slots, single 2.5 inch drive bay, two memory slots, battery and Wi-Fi card. Powering the laptop is a 46 watt hour battery and with a full charge and just watching YouTube videos with the screen on half brightness, lighting effects off and background apps disabled, I was able to use it for three hours and 51 minutes. It was able to swap over to Intel integrated graphics which helped improve battery thanks to Nvidia Optimus. While playing The Witcher 3 with medium settings and Nvidia's battery boost set to 30 FPS, the battery lasted for an hour and 16 minutes. However, when it had around 40% charge left, the frame rate dropped to around 10 FPS and it wasn't playable anymore, so you'll want to keep the power brick nearby if you're gaming. But I always recommend that anyway for best performance. Thermal testing was completed with an ambient room temperature of 21 degrees Celsius, so expect warmer temperatures in a warmer environment. Also keep in mind there are heat pipes shared between the processor and graphics, so a change in one component may affect the other. It's also worth noting that when you buy the laptop, Aftershock upgrade the thermal paste with Thermal Grizzly Cryonaut, which is what's in my unit, but you've also got the option to upgrade to Conductor Naught too. Starting at the bottom of the graph, at idle, the GPU was quite cool. A little warmer on the CPU, but not too bad considering the fans were silent. Moving up to the gaming test at stock, shown by the green bar, I've tested Watch Dogs 2, as I find it to use a good combination of CPU and GPU. Applying a CPU undervolt, shown in yellow, didn't really change the CPU temperatures much. The stress tests were done by running A to 64 and the Heaven benchmark at the same time in order to attempt to fully utilize both the processor and graphics. Continuing up, in the red bar, the temperatures rise a bit for the CPU, although cooler for the GPU, and no difference in temperatures with the CPU undervolt applied, but we'll see how this affected performance in the next graph. Overall, the temperatures are fairly low in these tests, due to a combination of the cryonaut paste, and while under a combined CPU and GPU load, the CPU TDP was capped at 35 watts. I'll also note I didn't test by manually maxing out the fans, because they were already maxed out during these tests. These are the average clock speeds for the same tests just shown. Starting down the bottom in the green bar with our gaming test, we can see there's a 200 MHz CPU boost with the undervolt applied, and a 160 MHz boost to the graphics with the overclock set. With the stress tests running, we're seeing a larger 400 MHz improvement to the CPU once undervolted, and a 140 MHz boost to the graphics with the overclock applied, shown by the red and purple bars. Although the power limit of the CPU can be boosted in this laptop, something uncommon in other 8750H laptops I've tested, I didn't test the combined CPU and GPU stress test or gaming with the power limit boosted, as I still found this workload to never pass 35 watts on the CPU, likely because the BIOS is just configured in this manner for a combined workload. These are the clock speeds I got while just running CPU only stress tests without any GPU load. At stock in the blue bar, we're a bit below the 3.9GHz all-core turbo speed, but just applying a minus 0.150 volt undervolt to the CPU boosted us by 400MHz. And with the power limit also boosted, shown in the red bar, we're only just shy of the full performance in this stress test. By default, in a CPU-only workload, the power limit is your standard 45 watts, but with Intel XTU, I was able to boost it to 56 watts for some extra performance. To demonstrate how this translates into performance, I've got some Cinebench CPU benchmarks here, with the older 7th gen i7-7700HQ just down the bottom for comparison. Single core performance didn't really change as there's never any throttling there, but in multi-core we can see how the power limit boost and undervolt affects CPU performance. Here are the GPU only clock speeds while under a graphical only stress test, both at stock and with a 200MHz GPU core overclock applied. Although on average in this test, we're seeing a 138 MHz boost due to power limitations on the graphics, which I wasn't able to modify using MSI Afterburner, and we'll see how this affects performance later. 
As for the external temperatures, where you'll actually be putting your hands, at idle it was in the low 30s in the centre, peaking to the high 30s right up the back, fairly standard. While gaming, the center reaches the mid 40s and around 50 degrees Celsius right up the back, with the left and right sides of the keyboard much cooler in comparison, and then similar results while under stress test. As for the fan noise produced by the laptop, I'll let you have a listen to some of these tests. At idle, the fan wasn't moving, so it was completely silent. While gaming and under stress test, it got fairly loud with the fan maxed out. Not too surprising, considering the specs inside and how thin the laptop is though. Finally, let's take a look at some gaming benchmarks. All games run at 1080p, with the latest Windows updates and these Nvidia drivers, with the software set to game mode for best performance. Fortnite was tested with the replay feature, and it was playing quite nicely even at epic settings which was still able to average above 70 FPS. And then at the lower levels, we really started taking advantage of the 144Hz panel. Overwatch was tested playing in the practice range, and again, very nice results in this well-optimized game at epic settings. No problems at all, with further improvements seen at lower settings. Battlefield 5 was tested in campaign mode and not in multiplayer mode, as it's easier to consistently reproduce the test run. It still played pretty well at ultra settings, almost able to average 60 FPS, but it was noticeably better with medium or low settings. Shadow of the Tomb Raider was tested with a built-in benchmark and DirectX 12, and again pretty nice results with a fairly large jump once we go to low or lowest settings. PUBG was tested using the replay feature, and as a less optimized game the frame rates aren't crazily high, but still very playable at around high settings, which was averaging above 60 FPS. CSGO was tested using the Oletical benchmark, and as usual, the frame rates at all settings were fairly high in this test. Rainbow Six Siege was tested with the built in benchmark, and again, very high frame rates from this test, which is pretty much always the case, with over 100 FPS reached at ultra settings in this test. Far Cry 5 was also tested with the built in benchmark, and some nice results for this test with this laptop, just able to average above 60 FPS at ultra settings. Assassin's Creed Odyssey was another that was tested with the built-in benchmark, and while I don't think you really need a high frame rate to play this game, the frame rate could be improved a fair bit with lower settings. Dota 2 was tested using a fairly intensive replay, so this should be a worst case scenario. These results are not the same as actually playing the game, which would result in higher performance. I use this test as it's reproducible and easy to compare with my other videos. Watch Dogs 2 is a demanding game, but as it doesn't seem to need a high frame rate to play, I have no trouble playing at ultra settings. Anything above 30 FPS, as long as the 1% low isn't too terrible, runs fine for me. Ghost Recon is another resource demanding game, and as usual, not great results at ultra settings, but that's normal for most laptops. Much less problems at pretty much any other setting level though. The Witcher 3 was tested with hairworks disabled, and even ultra settings were just able to get us a 60 FPS average although I found it played much nicer at high settings or below. Shadow of War was tested with a built-in benchmark, and quite high frame rates were seen regardless of settings. Now for the benchmarking tools. I've tested Heaven, Valley, and Superposition from Unigen, as well as Firestrike, TimeSpy, and VRMark from 3DMark. Just pause the video if you want a detailed look at these results. Overall, we're seeing great gaming performance from the GTX 1060 and i7-8750H combination and the dual channel memory is just icing on the cake. All games tested were able to run with good settings and still get decent frame rates. I've said it before and I'll say it again, the GTX 1060 is an awesome option for 1080p gaming, although you'll only really see high enough frame rates to make best use of the 144Hz panel in less demanding titles like Overwatch for instance. As we saw earlier, we've got the option of overclocking the graphics, undervolting the CPU, and boosting its power limit. So let's see how this actually helps improve gaming performance. The exact same Windows updates, game updates, and Nvidia drivers were installed, so there shouldn't be any other changes other than the ones listed here. Far Cry 5 was retested using the built-in benchmark. The average frame rates at ultra settings were 8.6% better compared to stock speeds, and a 7% boost to the 1% low, one of the largest improvements I've seen from overclocking and undervolting a laptop. 
As for storage, in Crystal Disk Mark, the 250GB SSD is giving us pretty nice read speeds for a SATA based drive and alright writes. I don't have a disk in the single 2.5 inch drive bay, and these are the speeds from the SD card slot using a V90 rated card. So not great, but still better to have an SD slot than not. For updated pricing, check the links in the description, as prices may change over time. At the time of recording, the Apex 15R is going for 1969 Australian dollars, so around 1300 US dollars for my international viewers without taxes. Just for context, the Acer Helios 300 with similar specs goes for around 2000 Australian dollars here, and in my opinion, the Apex 15 is a much better laptop. Stuff just costs more here, so just keep that in mind before you judge it purely on our Australian dollar pricing. So what did you guys think about the Apex 15R gaming laptop from Aftershock? Overall, I'm pretty impressed with the power we're able to get from such a thin unit, especially considering the thermals are kept in check. The GTX 1060 and i7 8750H combined with dual channel memory gives us excellent gaming performance in pretty much all modern games tested with good settings, and the 144Hz screen with thin bezels just looks great. The only downsides I personally had was that the keyboard felt a little cramped with the keys close together, but I could live with this as the mechanical feel is excellent. The control panel software is a little clunky feeling and could use an update, and Watch Dogs 2 actually thought it was cheat software and refused to start until I closed it, and the battery wasn't able to sustain gaming below 40%. Otherwise though, I really think the pros massively outweigh the cons with this laptop. You're getting good specs, solid build quality, a mechanical keyboard, thin bezels with a small overall footprint, great specs that stay relatively cool, and come on, even an RGB light bar. Let me know what you guys thought about the Apex 15R gaming laptop from Aftershock down in the comments. And leave a like to let me know if you found the review useful. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe for future tech videos like this one.